Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another monthly ARA Webinar Wednesday. I'm Jerry DiMaggio from ARA. I'll be serving as your moderator for today's webinar, which is entitled Use of Permeable Pavements. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my good friends and colleagues. Two speakers, as I mentioned, Lori Schrauss and Mr. David Hines. So first of all, a little bit of background on Lori. She's currently a principal engineer with ARA's Transportation Infrastructure Division in our Toronto, Canada office. She has extensive experience in pavement investigations, both condition assessments, falling weight deflectometer testing, scan testing, GPR, friction testing, and geotechnical investigations. She's well-versed in pavement design of all types, including rigid, flexible, composite, and of course, permeable pavements. She's also got a bit of experience with regard to the rehabilitation of existing roadways in rural and urban environments. She's uh, very experienced at project management as well as personnel management and done a number of forensic studies, led construction inspection teams and quality assurance testing. Lori has a, a, a BS and an MS degree from the University of Waterloo. Our second presenter is Mr. David Hine. David is a retired vice president at ARA and has been involved with the design and construction of permeable pavement systems for several decades. He's been involved with the development of three FHWA tech brief. We'll speak about the most recent one a bit today and associated webinars and workshops. He's a principal investigator for NCHRP study 2525 task 82 to provide guidelines in the use of permeable pavements on roadway shoulders. He's currently chair of an associated ASCE committee on permeable, permeable excuse me, interlocking pavement standards committee. Dave has authored over 75 papers. He's presented numerous webinars, workshops, and courses on the design construction and rehabilitation of permeable pavements. Now I'd like to turn the program over to our presenters. I believe Lori is presenting first. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Jerry. Again, my name is Lori. Thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to acknowledge Tom Yu from the Federal Highways Administration. He's the sponsor for this, this work. He's the Pavement Design Program Manager for the Office of Pre-Construction, Construction and Pavements. And there is a tech brief also that has been published on the FHWA's website, Use of Permeable Pavement. All right, so I'm just going to quickly kind of go over what we're going to talk about today. We're going to got to get into the nitty gritties of everything to give you a little bit of taste for the use of permeable pavements. So I'm going to go into a little bit of the background. Where did these come from? What have they been used for? How are we using them? Then we're going to take a look at what are permeable pavement systems? What exactly are we talking about here, you know, versus a, con a conventional pavement? Then we'll take a look at the effectiveness and the limitations. And then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dave Hine, and he's going to take a look at site suitability. How do we determine a site is a viable candidate for successful installation? Then we're going to look at the permeable pavement components, what actually makes up these, uh, these pavements. And then we'll look at some of the secondary components that we always want to include in our designs. We'll briefly touch on some designs, our specifications, construction, maintenance, we'll finish up with a brief summary, and then as Jerry said, we'll have some Q&A at the end. All right, so let's take a little, little bit in the background. Where did permeable pavements come from? So the use of permeable pavements originated in Europe more than 70 years ago, and they were basically various forms of an open aggregate or grasp pavement that promoted water infiltration into the pavement as opposed to off the pavement, which most of us are more familiar with. They were reinforced with a variety of different cell structures to help improve their load capacity. Then starting in around the 1970s, we started to see them being installed in the United States in parking lots, small roadways, things like that. So what really are they? A permeable pavement is, provides us another stormwater management best practice that is a sustainable best practice. We're now taking something that was used historically, never used for stormwater management, and we're trying to now, can we use this asset, these pavements, to help us on the stormwater side? So why we do that, we wanna help infiltrate water back into the subgrade to replenish the groundwater 
instead of forcing it into our other stormwater conveyance, you know, and then pumping it directly right back into lakes, streams, rivers, those kinds of things. We can use them also to reduce our pollutant loads in our stormwater. We're also looking at reducing our peak water flow and volumes during storm events. I think we're all very much aware now that we're seeing more and more storm events, flooding conditions where we weren't used to. So this is trying to use these pavements to help solve more of these problems. All right, so let's take a look at the permeable pavement systems themselves. Now, a permeable pavement system, it consists of a surface course that is more open than traditional pavements, which this allows water and, and stormwater to flow into the pavement and infiltrate into the underlying system. Now, this is completely different than traditional and conventional pavements. In traditional pavement design, we consider pavements and the surface as impermeable. Now, technically, they are permeable a little bit and water can move through them, but from a design perspective, they're considered impermeable. So we design them typically with 2% crossfall that allows the water to flow horizontally across the pavement into our traditional curbs, gutters, ditches, and other stormwater conveyance systems. But with a permeable pavement system, we're now going to allow the water to flow freely vertically into the pavement. And this is fundamentally very different than how we've all been taught as pavement designers, because there's three rules in pavement design, drainage, drainage, drainage. You need to get the water away as fast as possible. So permeable pavements is a completely different thought process. So when that water goes into that surface, what we want it to do is it's going to flow into an underground reservoir. This is our sub-base base reservoir. And what's gonna happen is that's, that reservoir is going to hold that water, slowing its movement down temporarily, and then allowing it to infiltrate into the subbrain. Now, we typically, that reservoir layer is about 30% void space. So there's a lot of volume to take in that water. Now, if we do have subgrade soil types with low infiltration rates, such as something like a clay, we are gonna have to install perforated drain pipes that just helps to make sure that we don't have any backflow or any issues related to not being able to drain the water. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So what is the first thing that always comes up when we talk about permeable pavement systems is what about clogging? What's going to happen when it clogs? And the answer is it will collect sediment and debris. That will happen and it is going to decrease our infiltration rate over time. But how we react to that and how we maintain that is going to be dependent on the site characteristics. So we want to do our best to minimize how fast we are going to lose that infiltration rate. So where is some of this debris going to come from? Well, the biggest source of the debris is going to be what we call biomass loading. And that's going to come from our trees and our vegetation. So things in the spring when we've got tree buds, maple keys, sticks, twigs, those kinds of things. And then in the fall, when we're losing trees, uh, we're, sorry, when we're losing the leaves, things like that, evergreens, when pine needles are falling, those kinds of things, that's gonna all enter into our pavement. Next, we're gonna have our vehicular and pedestrian dirt and debris. Now, we all, we've all kind of seen um, how much dirt and debris can come off vehicles, but we also have to be cognizant of what's come, that pedestrians can do as well. Dave and I actually recently had a project in California, and the biggest source of debris that entered the system was cigarette butts. So these are things we need to really look at at our site that what can provide these sources of debris. Other sources could be soil erosion from adjacent sites. Uh, maybe we have landscaping nearby that isn't contained or recreational facilities, maybe think baseball diamonds, things like that, that can bring that debris onto your pavement. And then the really big one here is improper winter maintenance. We do not want to apply sand to these pavements. And Dave's gonna talk a little bit more about that when we get to maintenance, but we do not apply sand in a winter maintenance aspect because it will um, clog up the pavement. Now, if we do have some clogging and that's inevitable, these pavements have been shown to still continue to perform under most storm events, even with that reduction in infiltration. 
However, we have to make sure that we're doing our timely inspections and proper maintenance and restoring that permeability so that we can have success over the life cycle of the pavement. Now, there are three basic types of design when we're looking at permeable pavements, and it's based on the subgrade infiltration. So the three types are a full infiltration, partial infiltration, and low infiltration design. So we'll take a look at each of them. All right, the first one is our full infiltration design. So if you take a look at our photo here, we've got our permeable surface. So that it's an open graded surface that's gonna allow water to flow vertically into our system. Now, some systems are designed with a choker course that allows for filtration. And then we have our big stone reservoir here. So that's what's gonna hold that water, slowing it down, preventing it, um, or not preventing it, but slowing it down before it, it enters into the subgrade. Now on a full infiltration design, we want the water to infiltrate the subgrade. That is the design objective of this type of design. Now we're gonna design and construct these in areas with high permeability subgrade materials. So those are gonna be areas like sand, sand and gravel, where we know that water can flow reasonably quickly into the subgrade. Now this type of design typically doesn't require additional or secondary features for supplemental drainage. Those features can be things like catch basins, under drains, outlet pipes, and on a more larger scale, stormwater management ponds. Now let's take a look at the partial infiltration design. So the partial infiltration design, we still want to infiltrate into the subgrade in this case. However, depending on maybe what the subgrade material might be, maybe we need to also inst install some kind of subgrade, subgrade or perforated pipe just to make sure that we don't backflow or overflow the pavement in case that we cannot infiltrate at, at, at the rate that's desirable. So in this case, we've got our water coming through our different, into our reservoir, and it can either infiltrate into the subgrade or into that perforated pipe. Now, the, the beauty of this is the designer can set that pipe outlet elevation based on your project site conditions, that, and then we can control how much discharge through the pipe versus infiltration can be done. Now let's take a look at the low infiltration design. Now this is where we would have sites with low permeability subgrades, things like clays and silty clays and silty clays, or areas where infiltration would be undesirable or detrimental. So looking back at our photo, we have our water infiltrating into our system we're either going to have it go into this perforated pipe, or in some cases, we may have to in, have an impermeable geosynthetic. And that's if we do not want the water to infiltrate the subgrade. So where would we see situations like that? So where we may have undesirable situation or detrimental would be subgrades, where the subgrade saturation could reduce the structural strength. We never want to sacrifice the structural strength because we need that to carry our loads. We could have areas of frost susceptibility, right? So in areas, so frost susceptibility or frost heaps can happen when you have, you have to have three conditions. You have to have cold climates that freeze, you have to have frost susceptible material, and you have to have water. So you have to have all three of those conditions in order to have a frost heap, which can lead to uh, uh, distresses that can, you know, affect the performance of the payment. So we will, if we if we can't if we do have an area with frost susceptibility materials, then we definitely don't want to be putting water into that. Another area would be next to adjacent foundation walls. We do not want to be undermining buildings foundation walls. Maybe we have a site that we actually want to use that water for water harvesting. Think uh, landscaping. So we're going to take that water and then we're going to reuse it to water grasses, flower beds, those kinds of things. Or maybe we have a brownfield site or contaminated subgrades where we don't want that water entering the subgrade. We're gonna put that impermeable geosynthetic and we're gonna put that water in through a perforated pipe. Now, depending on the site characteristics and the objectives of the project, each of those infiltration types, so your full, partial, or low, typically require additional design details to achieve whatever the goal of the project is. Now, these design details may include, but are not limited to what is your pavement surface type. And Dave's gonna talk a little bit about these in a little bit, but the three major ones are porous asphalt, pervious concrete, or permeable interlocking concrete pavers. 
What is our edge restraints? We typically need edge restraints to contain these pavements. What are we going to use for those? What are support features? Things like curbs, concrete ribbons, those kinds of things. We also install outlet pipes and monitoring walls. A lot of research is still being done into promote pavements, so we want to monitor the water. Sometimes we want to make, if, we're, if one of the design objectives is water quality improvement, we want to be able to access the water going through the system in order to test it for various things. So outlet pipes and monitoring wells can be installed. And then again, depending on the design objectives, are geosynthetics for separation or possibly water filtration. All right, so let's now take a look at the effectiveness and limitations of these systems. Now let's take a look at the benefits first, because they sound great so far. Permeable pavements are an absolutely effective and more sustainable means of managing our stormwater um, system, right? The, the, we have to think of this when we have pavements, parking lots, roadways, those kinds of things. It is a massive asset that takes up a lot of space. And traditionally, it's considered impermeable. So we have to deal with the water. But maybe there's an opportunity to use this large asset to our advantages to help the stormwater industry in, in reaching their goals as well. So again, what are the things we're looking at? So decreasing some of those peak runoff flow rates or the volume of stormwater runoff. I'm sure most of us have experienced a situation where we've been on a roadway or a highway and all of a sudden and a massive storm comes through and there's water flooding everywhere. And it takes time for that water to get to the other conveyance system. It takes time to get to the curbs. It takes time to get to the catch basins and it takes time to get into the system. Well, what if the pavement itself can help alleviate that and get it off the road? Those kinds of things. We want to possibly look at reducing our stormwater pollutant loading to our surface waters. So I live in Toronto and I live near the mouth of a river that enters into Lake Ontario. And after every massive storm, the lake is absolutely totally brown and disgusting. Well, maybe we can eliminate that if we can trap some of that runoff into the pavement so that the water can more freely enter into our system. Looking at increasing our groundwater recharge, there is a lot of the population that rely on groundwater for their drinking water. So the faster that we can get it back into the system benefits everyone. There's also the idea of reducing thermal impacts. Pavements can get very hot and the longer that water sits on them, it's raising the temperature of that water before it gets into the system. Now, the problem with that is in areas where they're highly environmentally sensitive, that can be catastrophic to uh, plant life and, and animal life. So by reducing that water that's sitting on the pavement, it can get into the pavement and we maybe don't get those incremental changes in, in, in temperatures. However, with all the benefits, there's absolutely some real potential concerns. So what are some of the limitations and things that maybe need a little bit more research and that we need to work on? So structural capacity. The pavement design engineers are worried about structural. They have to provide loading. What can these pavements maintain? Can they only accept pedestrian traffic? Only cars? Can we add buses? Can we add trucks? What's the structural capacity that we're going to look at with these pavements? Clogging, absolutely. If we clog the pavement so bad that it can no longer perform, then we've lost all of the benefits of the pavement. So clogging needs to be addressed. How can we mitigate clogging? How can we restore permeability once a section is clogged? Saturated roadway conditions, both underneath the roadway and on top of the roadway. If we lose our permeability and we can't get the water off, what does that mean for the surface related to safety, possibly hydroplaning? Rutting. Rutting is a, is a massive distress. It's a structural distress from the pavement. So if we're going to get rutting, how is that going to affect the pavement? And what does that mean for the safety and the condition of the pavement? If we get into a situation where we have rutting and we've also lost our permeability, we now can have areas for hydroplaning and those kinds of things, which is a safety aspect. And then once we get rutting, how do we fix the pavement? Freeze-thaw effects. How do these perform in cold climates? Well, the answer is so far in, in many applications, they're doing very well. Because one of the things that's coming out of the research is the water isn't even being able to stay on the surface. So we're not getting the surface freezing. And there's enough room in the reservoir to hold. We got 30% space in the reservoir. Water freezes at around 9%. So there's actually room. So we're not seeing those same effect, effects 
that would be expected in other traditional pavements. What's the constructability of these pavements? How do we construct these? Is it the same? Is it different? What's different? What do we need to know? How do we need to teach contractors to make sure that we're building them correctly? What are the maintenance requirements? We talked about winter sanding. You absolutely cannot put winter sand onto these pavements. So what is the maintenance? What is the long-term maintenance and rehabilitation strategies for these types of pavements? And then obviously all of that kind of essentially wraps up into durability. What is the durability of these pavements? What's the long-term long -term benefit? What is the long-term cycle of these pavements and how do they perform? Now for highway applications, they're generally not suitable for the highway driving surfaces. And that's mostly related to the durability and strength issues that I just spoke about. And things like depending on your subgrade type, because highways actually take up a lot of space, the fully permeable pavements may not be feasible or practical. Now, however, in the highway right away, we have lots of opportunities where we can look to install these. So think of things like the shoulders, potential median crossovers, your carpool lots, rest stops, snowplow turnarounds, maintenance yards facilities. So though we may not be able to use them right on the highway surfaces, maybe there's somewhere in the right of way that we can use these. All right, so one of the, the big issues that always comes to this, and Dave will talk to the, about this when we get to design, is our strength. So in all pavements, compaction is the key component in how we achieve strength. That is why compaction specifications are very tight in order that we get the pavement that we're expecting so that we can get the strength required that we need to support our loading. However, in permeable pavements, we need to balance strength and permeability. And here's where the challenge becomes. If we over compact our materials, specifically our base and our sub bases, and they become too dense, we are going to lose some of our permeability and lose that storage capacity. So we have to be aware of that. So we have to make sure that we adequately compact the materials just enough to give us the right strength, but then to also reach our hydrologic goals and achieve that permeability. So it's a real balance between making sure that we have strength and permeability. And just for an example, if you have very low permeability, something like 10 to the minus two inches per hour, that reservoir layer thickness required might be so thick that it's no longer practical. So this is where the challenge becomes in our design of these systems. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Dave. He's gonna talk about site suitability and how we determine whether our site is a good candidate for successful installation of a permeable pavement. Um, when, when people really started using a lot more permeable pavements, um, they, they wanted to use them everywhere pretty much, and, and everything was done by the professionals, so particularly not, not the pavement engineers. And I recall doing presentations in a variety of different locations all around the country, and I'd always ask, you know, how many engineers are in the audience, and I was the only one. Uh, that certainly has changed substantially over the the last 15 or 20 years and, and now we've got a lot of there engineers were telling me this like i was told there's no way we're ever going to build a permeable pavement in hawaii and we we Lori and i worked on a several projects that are in, in the recent past so we're starting to we be using these is there accepted so first thing is ultimately we need to make sure that we're permitted so local regulations typically govern a lot of the stormwater activities and so if they're not permitted obviously you can't build it uh, applicability for a particular site, um, there could be some restrictions on, on the suitability of those locations. And so uh, hydrologic control requirements or other restrictions that are there may be a, in, in force in a particular area may pro prohibit it from happening. Sometimes you've got one side of the state is more sandy soils than the other side is more clay soils. And so maybe it's permitted only on a, on a half a location or closer to where the higher permeability subgrades are. In, in terms of things like stormwater hotspots, you definitely don't want them near places where you have fueling facilities or landfills. Um, if there's a pot potential for uh, existing underground contamination. Uh, early in the days, I did some work in the UK where they use permeable pavements substantially. 
And uh, there were a lot of areas that were redeveloped. So they would have been an industrial facility or something like that, that might have had some contamination of the groundwater uh, of, the, sorry, of, the, of the ground. And so they would use a liner at the bottom of the permeable pavements and use it for, for storage, detaining it over time so we don't get all the water going to the same place at the same time. Um, and uh, so prevent that from happening. Uh, proximity to wells, septic systems and cesspools and things like that. There are definitely requirements, uh, federal and, and state requirements um, of avoiding these particular areas. Next. Uh, in terms of the um, next story. Ah, thank you. Um, Evaluating opportunities and drivers uh, for permeable pavements. Um, what are we trying to do? And I always ask people who want to build them, what is your goal? Are you trying to reduce stormwater runoff? Are you trying to reduce peak flow so we don't have all the water coming to one place and eroding things and, and things like that? Uh, improve runoff quality. If you're trying to remove particles from the water, so we're trying to filter them, we will design them a little bit differently, for example. And Laurie had mentioned earlier the temperature issue with uh, you know, high temperature uh, water coming off of a, 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 a conventional surface uh, causing uh, issues with fish and whatnot. Uh, increasing safety by reducing splash or surface water ponding. We do use permeable uh, asphalt material, for example, and have been doing this since the 60s and 70s uh, for a couple of reasons. One, to reduce noise, and the other, to reduce the amount of spray you have coming up on the back of a vehicle, for example. So in areas that have a lot of water, a lot of rainfall happening, you know, these may be used uh, as by rope, in, in essence. Uh, in terms of stormwater management, they putting in pipes in the ground, uh, putting in catch basins and, and stormwater ponds and things all have, th have, have negative things to associated with them, uh, digging the ground and making it non-uniform may lead to, to settlements and things like that on the surface of the pavement. Uh, uh, issues with piping. I was in Boston once when they received 50% uh, of their total annual rainwater in one 24-hour period. And there's so much water going through the pipes, they literally uh, burst the pipes, uh, eroded everything, and the pavement collapsed underneath them. So, uh, you know, these kind of things can contribute to problems. And things like stormwater ponds, you know, people, children could drown in them. I've seen that happen near where I used to live, in fact, once. And, and so, you know, reducing the sizes or eliminating things like stormwater ponds, you know, may, may improve safety. Uh, and then potentially incentives. For, so there are locations where you are required to do something to monitor the, or to manage the stormwater on your site. Uh, for example, many cities uh, will, will require things like green roofs on top of buildings so that the plants are taking up some of the water and it's not being being run off the site. Others, because they have issues with the underground, the, the size of the underground uh, piping system and, and limited capacity at pollution plants, for example, um, will require you to uh, use permeable pavements to, to slow water down to make it more manageable, for for uh, for instance. Uh, so and they, so this may be a requirement. It may be, you know, financially, they want you to do this. You, it all depends on a lot of different things that happen in the municipal environment particularly. Next. And in terms of, so as part of what Laurie and I worked on in the NCHRP project, the National Cooperative Higher Research Program pro uh, project, was developing something that would give um, stormwater professionals and architects and other people who are not typically um, cognizant of, of pavement design practices to uh, determine whether or not this would be a suitable site or not, for example. And so there are some, we divided it into primary, secondary, and tertiary considerations. Primary considerations involve things like environmental approval, uh, who has to make do the approvals to make this happen, um, regulatory requirements for the use of permeable pavements, um, things like longitudinal and transverse grades. So if it's a parking area has a steep slope or a road that has a steep slope, for example, we're not able to get as much water in as fast as we might in some, some areas that will have uh, lower grades. So something typically less than about 5% uh, of slope is, is, is uh, suitable for a permeable pavement. Not saying you can't do it with more, but there may be some issues uh, you need to deal with. In terms of depth of water table, if we're trying to infiltrate water into the ground, uh, we have to move it. If it's gonna go into the pavement, we have to take it somewhere. So either it infiltrates into the ground or it needs to move someplace. And so we will either uh, set up things so that we can spread the water over a larger area. Uh, even in low infiltration soils, you can still get water in, but it's how much. 
It's different if you're in a location where you get uh, very uh, sustained storms, like think Houston, for example, uh, or then difference than you see in, say, in Seattle, because you have different uh, rainfall distributions of how the rain comes. One of them, it comes all within the middle of the storm, a couple hours in the middle of the storm, and others, it kind of comes in slowly and then eventually gets a little more and eventually starts slowing down. And so how we take the water and how we move the water will be different for those two situations. Potential geotechnical risks, we're taking soils that, that you know, we want to put water into them. That means we're changing its moisture content. You know, there may be things like swelling that may happen with certain clays, for example, in Oklahoma or Texas. Uh, there may be other issues related to slope stabilities and things like that. And so you have to be cognizant of those geotechnical risks. And, and obviously groundwater contamination risk, not so much from the surface coming in. Uh, if there is contamination, you, you don't want to move it someplace else for water flow under the pavement surface. Next. Secondary considerations, um, things like receiving water quality standards. So if you go to some places, you may find uh, near the Rocky Mountains, for example, where you've got uh, streams that, that may be accepting um, uh, materials and total suspended solids uh, that come being washed off the pavements, for example, you know, may you may have a maximum that you can have. So they may assist in in, in uh, managing your water and your and your total suspended solids. Um, but again, somebody may have standards that you have to make sure you, you, you are, uh, are cognizant of. Uh, Lori already mentioned sand for winter maintenance. Uh, we have open graded surfaces. Uh, we can fill it full of sand. If the sand's all the same size, it actually will do something like filtration. If it is a dirty sand, a lot of fines content in it, for example, you know, then you may have issues with the pavement surface clogging. And I'll touch on those with maintenance a little bit further on. Um, run on facing areas with um, I was involved in, in a project in Atlanta there was a 10 or sorry six miles of, uh, of urban roadway that were turned into permanent pavement systems and we were out there doing a final check and there was someone uh, uh, cleaning out the cement truck the, the concrete truck on, on a site and it was coming around the corner and down through the permanent pavement system uh, so understanding how water can move and take things with it is really really important uh, low infiltration soil rates Great places for perennial pavements are the coast of Maine or Oregon or, or the, the south coast of Texas, for example. Lots of sandy materials anywhere near a, a major river. Lots of sands, again, around those locations. Really good. But 80% of North America is pretty much silt, silty clays and, and, and clay silt tills uh, coming back from the, uh, the glacial periods. And so we can still get water in, and it depends on where you are. If I have storms like you would have a 100-year storm in, in, uh, in Houston, you may have 14, 16, 18 inches of rain in 24 hours. If you're in Phoenix, it will be different. So again, understanding how we need to deal with those certain conditions is really important. Um, target design volumes and runoff rates, how much to, can we slow the water down? Water moving will take things with it. If you slow the water down, gravity works, and, and the, the contaminants in it probably will settle to the bottom. That's how we got most of our lakes and stuff in the past. Um, geometric conditions. Uh, it's it's more a little more difficult to work with the materials typically uh, and how they work because they're permeable surface. So complicated geometrical conditions, we've got all kinds of different features in the pavement, for example, in a parking lot, you know, may make it more difficult, which will increase the cost obviously as well. Uh, risk of flooding, typically it, they're used to prevent floods from happening or to store water, um, stormwater control requirements, uh, peak flow control and maintenance protocols are all important components to ensure that the permeable pavement system is going to work properly. Next. Other considerations. Uh, so part of that NCHRP project, we developed this template decision matrix for permeable pavement. So we took the AASHTO pavement design guide, and in there it has primary, secondary, and, and other, other considerations for pa different pavement types. And so we took that matrix basically because it's known well to most pavement engineers, and we've added different things to, for people to look at. And like good engineers, we produce a spreadsheet, we've got weighting factors, we've got higher weighting on the primary than the secondary than the tertiary conditions or the other conditions, and you've got a simple uh, uh, ABC kind of rating system, so low, medium, and high risk. You go through the list, you pick down from the drop down box what you want to do, and at the end of it, when you get down to the bottom, uh, you're going to get a, a yes, no, or could be used, for example. And we can now account for things like utilities or uh, you know, potential unknown site conditions, potential for chemical spills, for example. And we use one owner experience and resources because you know people want to do this and they want to make it work. 
And you know, we'll go out and look at a site and they'll say, well, here, I've given you eight locations and you can figure out which one of these we're gonna use. And we come back and say, none. None of these are suitable for a permeable pavement. And they go, why? So we go through the scoring matrix and they go, yeah, yeah I agree. That's you know, the condition. And each of these matrices are basically different depending on um, the local conditions. So they're kind of uh, made not as a, as a general template that is modified for the general conditions. Next. So moving on to permeable pavement components. Next, sorry. Uh, we have basically three primary types of permeable pavement systems. There are others, uh, but I'll talk about the, the most commonly used ones now. Porous asphalt, it's, it's, um, it's a different, it's, it's the same components. We have aggregates, we have coarse aggregates and fine aggregates, and we have asphalt cement holding it together, uh, but we change the voids content. Uh, so we're conventional pavements are, are six to 8% air voids. We're looking for something 15, 20, 25, 30% uh, uh, void structures. And so we need to do things to ensure that the asphalt cement is gonna bind to the aggregates. And so we can use polymer modifiers, we can use fibers, a bunch of other different things ultimately. And so it's a balance of providing uh, surface infiltration capacity, well, as Lori mentioned, also ability to resist traffic, for example. Next. Pervious concrete, um, you know, in order to make pervious concrete, re regular concrete also has air voids in it, typically seven, six, seven, eight percent air voids in it. The air voids are there so that we can, uh, when water is in the concrete and it expands 9%, as, as Laurie mentioned during freezing, it has a place to go. If we didn't do that, it will self rubbleize It'll turn itself into gravel, basically. And so we were changing this air void content uh, to make it higher, to make it uh, ability to, to have water flow into it, obviously. And again, we can use things like fibers to increase the strength and durability. And the, the key, this component is making sure you have enough um, water to, to hydrate the cement to make sure that everything binds together. Permeable interlocking concrete pavement or bricks as well, uh, they do brick pavements also, um, are themselves not typically porous. So the bricks are solid concrete. They have um, you know, 8,000, 9,000 PSI compressive strength in them. Uh, the only difference between that and conventional interlocking concrete pavers are is that we do not put sand in the joints. The sand's in the joints to allow shear capacity when a vehicle drives across individual bricks or, or blocks. And we put uh, we we can't get a lot of water into that. They're relatively impermeable, actually. And so we put uh, stone chips in the joints, typically something like like uh, five three eighths uh, inch uh, diameter uh, stone chips, for example. And the pavers themselves are seated on a bedding layer, uh, or the bricks, or the grids, or whatever else we're using on the surface. So we put them on a bedding layer to allow them to have a nice smooth surface when we're driving across them. Um, typically, uh, the the joints I said are filled with stone chips. And that then provides you with interlock, but that also reduces the structural capacity of those interlocking concrete, uh, permeable interlocking concrete pavements compared to conventional pavements. Uh, bases and sub-bases, they're open graded drainage or open graded uh, aggregates. We do this, we use these for concrete pavements, for example, or airport pavements. We, we have open graded drainage layers and have been doing that for many, many years. And But we're also not just having a, a single layer, maybe four inches in thick, the whole pavement needs to be permeable. So it has to get into the into the bricks, into the concrete, into the asphalt. It needs to go through the base. Uh, typically, the sub base is relatively large, like you see in the photograph here. They're fairly large pieces, two maybe three inches sometimes. Think of railway ballast. That's kind of a common uh, comparison for it. And the more single size they are, the more porosity you will have. Therefore, the more more storage capacity. And if I've got something that's just cars, for example. I'm not so worried I can use all one size stones. If I have something that has uh, like buses or, or heavier uh, transport trucks and things like that, we will probably put a graded aggregate in there, sacrifice some of the, uh, the porosity for strength because we wanna make sure that we're not getting things like rutting that, uh, that uh, were mentioned earlier by Lori. Next. Filter courses, you may include a filter course. Um, it was commonly used in Colorado, actually. One of the per people that was on my uh, permeable pavement committee with American Society of Civil Engineers um, used this. And so they built basically a permeable pavement system and then actually dumped sand on the lower layers of the sub base and to create basically a filter layer. So it's very much like what you would use in a pollution plant, for example. And so those, those filter beds will help to treat wastewater, to wastewater, get the total suspended solids out of it. Uh, and uh, the, um, 
the uh, elements may have been separated from each other using things like a choker course or geotextiles, uh, some geosynthetics that'll prevent the, the subgrade from uh, entering below the pavement structure and, and contaminating the bottom of the pavement structure. Next. Underdrains, uh, Laurie showed you some pictures of underdrains as well. Underdrains may be used in conventional pavements, of course, and under curbs, for example, and getting water away from the pavement structures. But if you are just, you know, sandy soils, water will go all the way through it into the sand. It'll be like like beach sand, you know, it goes right into, the, into it very quickly. And so typically we have a requirement by agencies that say we would like to have the water out of the pavement within 24, 48, or 72 hours. That's the basic uh, that I've seen primarily. And, and part of this is, to, is to, to make room for more storms that may happen, for example, uh, or it may be issues with things like, you know, mosquitoes sitting in or, you know, breeding or whatnot in, in the pavement structure. Uh, under drains are typically four to six inches in diameter, uh, typically PVC uh, pipe, piping systems. So not always using things like the, uh, the drain tile you see in farms, for example, something a little more strength to it so that as during construction, we don't damage these pipes, for example, or we, we socket them into the subgrade, like you see in this cross section there. So we've got a pipe in a trench that is at the low point. Water's going to go to that low point. We're still going to try and infiltrate water into the ground, but when it gets to a certain height in the pavement structure, we don't want it to overflow the pavement. And so we will we will turn turn the pipe upwards at its end point, or do something else to basically uh, to, to trigger the pavement to start uh, taking water uh, out of the pavement system. Next. So outlet structures, you may the pavement itself may be connected to something else. It may just simply be going out to a stormwater pond, for example. Uh, but in, in other places, you want to control the depth. So you may install something like you see here. It's basically a catch basin um, uh, system with a barrier in between. So we've got water coming out of the pavement from the left. It goes to the, the, the portion of the, of the container on the left side. As the water starts rising, we'll put a V-notch weir, as it's called, in the, in the, in the, con the uh, containment wall. And so then at a certain point, it will start to dribble water out. And if the pavement fills up faster, it will go across the V-notch weir and continue to discharge water to the right-hand side. So it moves from the left, basically, to the right. These can be very small, two foot by two foot kind of thing, just something to control the water depth. Geosynthetics, um, not always the fan of using these. I've definitely used them in many pavement applications, and, and certainly if there's a good reason to, I definitely will use them. Uh, but one of the people on our committee actually calls it their built-in uh, failure layer, because uh, a lot of times they're not installed properly, they're not uh, connected, uh, they move around during construction, and things like that. Uh, the most common use in permeable pavements is not in the pavement structure, but at the bottom of the pavement structure. So that's the location where you may have the big stones kind of punching into the, the wet subgrade because water is going to be going into the system. So we don't want them to, to migrate its way up into the permeable pavement and potentially cause clogging within the pavement structure. Uh, liners are used typically for low infiltration designs to recover stormwater. That's the most common thing I've seen is that we are saving the water, putting it into an underground cistern and pumping it up to feed the plants kind of thing. Um, they may also be used at the interfaces between permeable and non-permeable pavements or against things like the uh, basement walls. As Lori mentioned, they're used commonly for uh, back alleyways and things like that. And so we get water coming off the buildings, goes into the permeable pavement, and then uh, out into maybe even the storm drain system, possibly. But we don't want water to sit there and, and go into the, uh, uh, into the underground structures or things, things like that. Next. Edge restraints, Laurie mentioned edge restraints as well. Edge restraints are, are, are definitely needed for things like grids and, and bricks and, and interlocking concrete pavements because you need an edge restraint for them regardless. So for example, in this photograph, this is a parking lot. You see a central area that is actually underlined by open graded aggregate as well. The curbs there have a little cutout in them. So if the water can't get into the permeable pavement, the intensity of the storm is so high, it can't get in. It at least has another place to go and it still will infiltrate into the ground, for example. They're also a good idea in parking spots and, and areas where we've got vehicular traffic close to the end of the system because even asphalt and concrete, if you drive too close to the edge, you potentially could break. And so curb systems or, or, or uh, flush curbs, for example, L brackets, L, L channels that, that, cut, that are like uh, kind of just a, a aluminum or plastic type of things and that have nails in them and you nail them into the ground, for example, um, not something like you use to hold your plants back in your front garden, uh, but something a little bit more robust than that. Next. 
Monitoring wells, we can also use monitoring wells. Um, Gloria mentioned those as well. A lot of people put them in the payment structure. I don't like putting uh, openings in the payment structure, be it asphalt, concrete, or paving stones. The, what you see here in this graphic, we have in our ASE standard, and it's it's off the backside of the pavement in the grass system. So what we're doing is, is keeping it away from the pavement, but yet the source of water comes from in the pavement. So basically this is just uh, allowing you to get access. You can take water for water sampling, for example, and it's really good to see what the depth of water is in the pavement structure to make sure everything is still infiltrating. Next. Um, design, quickly, uh, design uh, um, uh, applications. It basically, as Moira mentioned, involves both structural and hydrologic design. Build it so it will hold, handle the water you need and build it so you can handle the traffic. Um, you may uh, do, be doing this for re or reducing flooding or erosion or, uh, for, or keeping the water to use for uh, something like the plants or aquifer re re recharge, obviously. Uh, but success is ensuring that you understand the, pro the proper practices for permeable pavement to ensure that you achieve your goals. Next. Uh, hydrologic, structural and hydrological gaps. There are, I recently completed a um, strategic planning session for one of the associations, and we talked about things that we still need to know. What else should we be looking at? Um, so things like pervious concrete and uh, flexural strength, because we take cylinders and we, you know, we measure and, comp uh, and use comp uh, compression rather to determine the compressive strength of it, but it's more difficult to get it done right in a lab because it's not uh, like dense graded concrete. It's got a much lower modulus elasticity. We need to be able to design for heavier traffic volume and vehicle weights. These The organizations in North America typically look at something like 1 million equivalent signal axle loads for the pavement people, uh, yet they're in Europe they're doing 10 million. And so we were kind of hesitant at the beginning, saying, well, we shouldn't put too much traffic on these pavements, and now we're finding out they're working well, so we need to design them for the heavier uh, pavements, uh, uh, heavier loadings as well. Um, deflection response. A, Open graded structure responds differently than a dense graded uh, structure in terms of the, the pavement surface deflection. I watch garbage trucks go across them and watch the pavement go up and down and it, look, it comes back perfectly fine. It's like a bunch of springs in the pavement, for example. Um, what, how much water are we reducing? Like, how do you determine what the water reduction is? Uh, if you don't know exactly what we were collecting before, you know, are we, are we reducing the amount of water by 50% or 25% or, you know, looking at ways of in, ensuring that we get it into the ground, for example. And then how effective is it for pollution reduction? Things like um, uh, chemicals used in, in uh, phosphates and whatnot used in, in uh, ni um, nitrogen, used in farming, for example. Um, you know, how, how much are we helping the, the environment over a large area, particularly? And then ultimately, long-term durability and performance. Uh, we've got lots of work that's been done on maintenance and, and uh, cleaning them after they've been clogged, for example, in various places in, at uh, e environmental uh, and uh, EPA's headquarters and up in Minnesota and other places like that. Next. Um, specifications. And, uh, next, Lauren. Um, Ultimately, characterization and specification of stabilized bases and sub-bases is important because they, again, use these in Europe. We haven't used much in North America. We already mentioned compaction pr uh, procedures. Uh, there's a big research project going on currently that is, uh, uh, this summer will be, uh, be released, and it's all about using lightweight deflectometers, for example, to measure the, the appropriate amount of compaction. Uh, and then ultimately putting this into standards, which is really important. Next. Construction, uh, very much like conventional pavements, it's simply everybody needs to know it's a permeable pavement. Um, I worked in the Olympic Village in Vancouver in 2010. You know, we told everybody what it was. Uh, we told them we had to protect it during construction. They were gonna do it last. They couldn't wait because the Olympics are coming. They did it. They put dirt all over the entire pavement stru structure and then said, can we spray wash it out? Well, no, you're gonna be pushing it into the permeable pavement. So that's not good. So people understanding the sequencing, uh, what is a permeable pavement, being cognizant of that. Lori showed you a picture of, of, of uh, topsoil sitting on a permeable pavement. You know, that's ridiculous, but they didn't know. They put up uh, signs and tell people what you can and can't do, for example. Next. Um, other construction gaps, uh, placement, compaction, you know, we need to compact the asphalt. We need to ensure that we, we, uh, we're getting the, the um, cement uh, cured, uh, hydrating, basically, um, and the compaction I've already mentioned. Uh, in measuring surface infiltration, how do we know? We've got an ASDM standard for, for pavers and one for uh, concrete pavements, uh, but not for others. 
Uh, you can use the concrete one for asphalt if you wanted to, but it's 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 been uh, written basically for concrete pavements. And then all the stuff about field and laboratory quality control and assurance standards, making sure that all of these things will will make sure we get a long a long serving pavement. Next. Uh, maintenance, a couple of key things about maintenance is that all pavements need maintenance. Um, if you ensure that you're continually, you know, checking on your pavements and making sure that there's a place to, where the water is still getting through the pavement structure is obviously good. Um, you, we, there's all kinds of stuff out there on vacuum sweeping and things like that to, to declog pavements that have already been clogged, for example. And then ultimately under, making people understand. You know, we're, we're cutting grass and blowing it onto the pavement, all right? Probably not a good idea. I watched that this morning actually happen, and I, I'm looking, going, this is crazy. Why are you doing this? They don't know, so make sure that they know what's going on ultimately. Next. Um, and so gaps in maintenance, main, maintenance manuals and training, all projects that Gloria and I work on, we provide a maintenance manual, the guidance, we give them training, um, you know, PowerPoint presentations and all the things of what you should and should not do, for example. Um, so we make sure that we don't get pavements that are clogged. Winter maintenance typically is less than needed for a conventional pavement because we're taking heated from the ground. You know, the earth is, is warm underneath, and so it melts the snow faster. It gets rid of the water on the surface. We don't have icing on the surface, for example. And so how do we uh, show the benefits and value for the non-pavement related things like um, reducing the size of a stormwater pond, for example, or reduce maintenance cost? Next. In summary, uh, ultimately, the primary drivers are uh, environmental things. How do we deal with stormwater? Uh, how do we clean the stormwater, for, for example? Uh, as Lori mentioned, the first three things you learn in pavement design is drainage, 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 keep the water away from the pavement, and now we're putting it in. So we want to make sure that people understand the, the, the potential consequences of that and design for them. Uh, they've got a long history of use. We used permanent pavements in the 70s. Um, a lot of them were like the grass paver type things or concrete on its side. And so they didn't get a lot of, of uh, uh, they, some of them failed. And obviously people said, oh, that doesn't work anymore. So for example, and then ultimately life cycle costing needs to be done to evaluate, you know, how long do they last? How do we put them in and compare them to conventional pavements and that type of thing. Next slide. So here are some of the resources that are out there. Um, I won't go through them all in any detail, so you can see them from the, uh, the text back if you, uh, you have a look of it. And um, uh, with that, um, I think, go to the last one, Larry. Success is in the detail. So I'll turn it back to you guys. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Larry. Fantastic presentation. Um, we ran a little bit over. We've got a large number of uh, questions. We've got a little bit of time left to address questions, but before we get to that, I'll, I'll fill you in on those questions as we don't can't get to. So coming up, uh, we usually advertise our future webinars historically. Uh, this is again today's program is a 63rd monthly ARA webinar. All of our webinars are presented by current or former ARA employees. So if we would like to register for ARA webinars, you see the address shown on this slide. On July 31st, we'll be changing topics quite a bit. We do like to mix it up intentionally. Our good colleague, Willie Morris from our Panama City, Florida office, be presenting transforming how we teach and learn. Uh, and Willie's got a great deal of experience in that. Adoptive immersive training, the creation and the deployment of that. Uh, we've uh, currently got presentation topics and speakers through December of 2024. We normally advertise two or three of the upcoming webinars. We haven't formalized the dates as yet for that, uh, those programs. So bear with us. A number of you have asked questions of obtaining copies of the presentation. I'll speak to that just momentarily. So uh, we've got um, really regretfully only about two minutes to address questions. So rather than to address the questions, what I'd like you, um, to do is to recognize that Lori and David have made their email addresses available. If you didn't have time uh, to address your question or if you have a follow-up question to the questions that'll be answered individually, uh, please send uh, an email to either Lori or David or both of them during the next 24 hour period. We ask only that your questions not be in the form of a specific consulting project question that's just not appropriate for us to address. So let me see if we could squeeze one question in here. A number of questions came about related to 
any guidance uh, that was specifically related to airport pavement applications? Could either or both of you speak briefly to that? Yeah. I'm going to let yeah. Dave research. Sorry, I was, I, was, I, was muted. I was muted. Sorry. Uh, they have definitely been used in airport applications, but are typically used in locations like uh, cell phone waiting areas, parking lots. Um, uh, I've seen them in airside only in Perry people where they would go out and have lunch kind of thing. Uh, typically not on the airfield uh, running surfaces at all. Uh, so it's the same type, type of parking lots and, and internal roadways and things like that, but not on airfields directly. Okay, thank you. Let's see if we could squeeze one more in here. Um, question came about, uh, Dave, you addressed geosynthetics and permeable pavement applications. Mm -hmm. Do you have any guidance, either of you, related to how do you best prevent the clogging of geosynthetics, recognizing there's over 600 products that are available yeah. under that family? <laughs> there's there's a lot of products under that family. Um, in the ASE standards called ASE 6818, uh, there is some guidance in there about the use of geosynthetics specifically and from, uh, you know, of, of selecting them. So I suggest if you're really interested in that, you pick up uh, ASCE's uh, 6818 standard, design standard. Okay, thank you, Dave. And we do have, Laurie and David, we do have a, a probably a half a dozen to a dozen other questions. Regretfully, we don't have time to go through those. For those of you that submitted questions or will be submitting questions, uh, we've captured the questions that have been submitted. I share the email addresses of Lori and David, and they'll be responding to you individually. So again, all we ask is that you don't ask a consulting question. That's just not cricket, so to speak. So all webinar participants who joined us for the entire hour of this program will be entitled and will receive one, a PDA, one hour of PDH certificate and a copy of the presentation. So just to clarify related to the copy of the presentation, because of the intellectual property concerns that uh, we all deal with today, what we'll be providing is a PDF copy of the presentation. Generally, we share it in a two slide format. Please allow us a couple of weeks to get that available. All of the ARA webinars are available. They're video recorded. Again, it takes us about a week to post that. So if you miss the session or your friends miss today's session, you have that ability to go back and look at some of these excellent presentations by all ARA employees. So ARA, Applied Research Associates, is always looking for great people to join our team. We have several mantras that we use, but the one that sticks with me with my 11 years with the company is we do engineering and science for fun and profit. We currently have a number of exciting opportunities throughout the United States. And specifically, if you're interested in employment opportunities currently with ARA's transportation and our infrastructure offices, that's one of our six business units, please send a brief resume and contact information to the address that you see here. I want to thank you all and have a blessed day. Lori and David broke the record for the number of registrants at an ARA monthly webinar. Hallelujah. <laughs> thank you both. Great job. Thanks very much. Thanks, back everybody. To, back to our host, Ms. Heidi Rockwood.